What is antimatter? How do we make it in the lab? What do we do with it? And what might we do with it in the future? During this program, we are trying to answer all these and many more questions that will be coming from you. And we are going to do that by listening to what the physicists who work with antimatter every day have to tell us about it. We are also going to take you to the latest scientific installation that is getting ready to produce very large quantities of antimatter very soon here at CERN. And all these are going to be supported by video clips and animation that our technical team up there and here have prepared for us. Let me wish them good luck and to all of us, because this is no easy task. We are facing here a very, very complex technical challenge. Putting all sorts of sign on the internet live is not easy. I also have to thank here the School of Sound Engineering from Geneva, who are dealing with sound for us today, and UNITNET from Zurich, who was putting everything up on the internet. I'm here in the Live from Sun studio, and you can see I'm surrounded by young faces, because this kind of program is really intended for school students, for school students from all over the world. And indeed, we have a live interactive connection with Finland, a school class from the very middle of the country, from a place called Ulajervi. Hello, Ulajervi. Can you hear me? Here they are. Hi. We'll get back to you very soon. Keep, keep staying with us. It's now time to start our adventure to the anti-world. Let me introduce to you my co-presenter, Mick, who is standing right above my head up there on the bridge. Mick, what are you doing up there? Hi, Paula. Hi, everybody. Well, first of all, I'm standing in the sun because it's a beautiful day here in Geneva. But it's also a great place to take a look at the world's first antimatter producing machine, LEAR, the low energy anti proton ring. It's right behind me in a hole, so let's go and take a look. What did we do with LEAR? Well, LEAR was used to collect antiprotons, store them, slow them down so that they could be combined with anti-electrons to make the world's first atoms of anti-hydrogen. It's a typical example of a particle accelerator and I hope that you will be able to see that it's roughly circular, about 20 to 30 meters in diameter, and it consists of a few significant components that I'll try to describe to you. First of all, there's a pipe that runs around the circumference of this machine, and it's inside this pipe that the antiprotons circulated. They were kept in their, on their track by large bending magnets, the orange ones that I hope that you spotted as the camera went round the edge of the ring. These were used to keep the antiparticles running round the ring so that they could be slowed down. Now I realize that I've used some names and terms which may be a little bit difficult to understand, but it's one of the challenges for us all on this program to explain these in simple terms. Right now, what we'd like to do is tell you a little bit more about what CERN is. What do we do here? Here's a short video clip, and while it's running, I'm going to join Paula down in the studio audience. I'll see you in a couple of minutes. CERN is the world's largest scientific laboratory. It covers six square kilometers scattered over 12 sites, either side of the Franco-Swiss border near Geneva. At over 100 meters underground, 34 kilometers of tunnels and caverns the size of cathedrals host facilities for experimental physics. Scientists from all over the world work here in international collaborations to study and understand the structure of matter and the forces that hold it together. Stars, planets, seas, air, humans, and everything around us is made of matter. Matter is made of atoms. Atoms are made of electrons orbiting around a nucleus, which in turn is made of protons and neutrons. Inside these, we find quarks. 
by accelerating a beam of particles to nearly the speed of light and shooting them into a material target, we can break the nucleus and study the quarks and other particles. Most of these particles only existed in the primordial universe for a fraction of a second after the Big Bang when all the energy transformed into matter. In CERN's laboratories, we can recreate the same energy conditions that existed then and observe the formation of new matter and of its opposite, the antimatter. The experimental and theoretical study of these conditions allows us to understand the fundamental laws of nature and to unveil the ultimate mysteries that govern our universe. We've just seen in this video the vast, wide-ranging activities that CERN, this world lab, carries out in the field of particle research. Also, Mick has taken us to see the first machine that produced the first nine antiatoms. It's now time to get in our first guest. I'm welcoming today Alvaro de Rucula. Good morning, Paola. Hi, Alvaro. Alvaro is a theoretical physicist here at CERN. And, of course, the first question you would, ask, you would ask a theoretical physicist is, tell us what is antimatter. But before doing that, I would like to know from a physicist, how do you describe matter? What is matter first? If you look around yourselves, there are two types of stuff that you can see. One of them is, for instance, air or water or Paula. All these things are made of matter. And matter is, as we saw before, made of atoms, and atoms contain electrons and protons and neutrons. Now, there is another kind of particle, which are the particles of light, which are called photons. And light is the other type of stuff that you see around. Now, what is the fundamental difference between these two types of things, matter and light? They are both made of particles, but the particles are slightly different. If you look at a, um, some amount of... Um, matter, such as air, and you put it in a box, you can pump in more air and more air and more air, and as the pressure goes up, it becomes a liquid, and eventually it becomes a solid, and then there comes a moment where it is very, very difficult to put extra particles in. You reach a state where it is impossible to put new particles of matter in the same state. Now, light is different. If you take a box containing light, for instance, with internal reflecting mirrors so that the photons of light can bounce around the box, you can always add another photon, and another photon, and another photon, and the box never gets filled. In fact, there comes a moment, believe it or not, where you reach a state where it is even easier to put an extra photon and an extra photon. So matter and light are both made of particles, but the particles are distinguished by the way you can pack them into a box. Some of them fill the box, the others never fill the box. Okay, so if I understand well, everything around us, including ourselves, is made of particles, and all this is called matter. So what is antimatter then? Antimatter is slightly more difficult to explain because we have no everyday experience of antimatter. There is no antimatter around us. Um, the idea of antimatter was occurred to someone before it was actually discovered. It happened in the following fashion. At the beginning of the 20th century, there were two big revolutions in our understanding of nature. One of them was the development of the theory of relativity, and the other one was the development of quantum mechanics. Now, there was a genius by the name of Paul Dirac, who in the 1920s or 1930s had the idea, or demonstrated, that if both relativity and quantum mechanics were correct descriptions of nature, then for every particle of matter, there should be a corresponding antiparticle with practically the same properties, except the opposite charge. If the particle has a charge, the antiparticle has the opposite charge. And for instance, for the electron, there should be an anti-electron, which is also called a proton. And for the proton, there should be a brother called the antiproton, which is its antiparticle, so that every particle of matter has a corresponding particle of antimatter. Now, what is the behavior and the relation between matter, antimatter, and the particles of light, it is the following. If you take something made of matter, such as my hand, and you put it together with something made of antimatter, suppose that my other hand was made of antimatter, and you touch them, then boom, 
out they go, and the energy in these two things gets converted into particles of light. That's how matter, antimatter, and light are connected. Okay, but you just said that there is, we are all made of matter. So where has all the antimatter gone? That's a very good question. Now, I must first tell you that what I have been telling you so far are things that we know. I'm now going to talk about things that we conjecture. We believe that in the beginning of the universe, when it had a life, an age of a fraction of a second, there were equal amounts of matter and antimatter, so that it was perfectly symmetric. Then the question that arises is, how comes the matter didn't annihilate the antimatter and it all became light? Well, that almost happened, but not quite. We believe that something like the following happened. Suppose you take an object and you put it in a symmetric position relative to light, sorry, left and right. Now, if I let it fall, it will fall either left or right with equal probability. But once it has fallen on one side, that's the side in which it is, it is the left, it's no longer the right. This is called a breaking spontaneously of a symmetry. And it's something that might happen in the evolution of some system. We believe that the universe at the beginning suffered a similar um, evolution and the amounts of matter and antimatter got slightly asymmetric. So that for every billion particles of antimatter, there were a billion plus one particles of matter. So that when matter and antimatter annihilated, only the odd particle of matter every uh, billion survived, and the rest was converted in light. And that is why the universe nowadays is made of a billion times, more or less, more particles of light than particles of matter. Our universe, in counting numbers, is essentially made of light, and there is a little sprinkling of matter, which is one particle every billion particles. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alvaro. Alvaro is going to stay with us for the interactive part of our program, which is going to happen in a few minutes' time. For now, I'd like to introduce uh, Rolf Landauer. Hi, Rolf is a German physicist working at CERN, an experimental physicist. Among some of the things that he's done, he's actually worked on the machine that I showed you earlier. Now, Rolf, I'm covered in dust particles because I've been climbing up there over those concrete blocks. But I guess these are not the sort of particles that we're talking about. Could you put these particles in context, please, that we're yes. talking about? I mean, if I looked at the particles of dust on you, I mean, and I looked with a very good microphone, a microscope, I would see they are made out of tiny, tiny atoms, 10,000 times or 100,000 times smaller than these dust particles. And then, if I look at the atoms, I would find they are made out of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay. And so when we are speaking of particles, we speak of these protons and the electrons. Okay, thanks. So, in practical terms, how do we make antimatter? Well, first of all, antimatter cannot be dug out of the ground anyway. It's not lying around, as Alvaro said. So we have to make it. But how do we make new particles? So, just accidentally, I brought in this little equation here, which you may recognize. I mean, I always have to bring it with me so I remember. E equals mc squared. Well, many people um, know that formula, but um, sometimes it's not exactly evident what it means. What, what it means is that anything which has a mass has an energy in it, but a big amount. I mean, just imagine that would be a, a currency and an exchange rate. See, this is, for example, pound, and that is pound, and that is lira, for example. Then there would be a factor of 1,000 in between the two. But this C squared, the square of the speed of light, is a very, very big number with 17 zeros. So that means a tiny amount of matter contains a big amount of energy. Now, if we want to make matter out of energy, we have to get this big amount of energy somewhere in a very tiny amount of space. And then when it's sort of this energy is concentrated on a tiny amount of space, which is about the size of this new particle, then nature decides to have a new particle made. And to do this, we use a particle accelerator, is that exactly, right? Exactly, that is right. And you just happen to have brought along with you oh, your course. favorite model of yes. a particle accelerator. Well, you see, I like to play with trains. So that explains why I work here. So this train somehow represents a particle accelerator. There's a circle. Okay, there's a circle. There is our particle. This, in this case, it's a proton. And a proton has an electric charge. Now, in order to make that proton move faster, we apply an electric field here, between here and here, and that gives it a little push. So I start to push it, 
voila. And now it stays with the same speed and it goes around and we have placed magnets all around here in order to make it come around Remember to the same place. Remember those orange magnets that were located on Leah here That's right. and here. Okay, now every time it comes here it gets another push. So now it goes a bit faster and another push. Voila, it goes even faster. Now when we have concentrated enough energy on that particle here, we at one time, I tell Mick, to extract the particle and we sh let it bump into a block of matter and there it will collide with the nucleus and during that collision the energy which is in the movement now will be set free and produces particles. Shall we try? Okay, let's go. Next time round. All right. Here we go. There it comes and voila. Yeah. <laughs> and you see we've produced four new particles there. <laughs> well, we are cheating a bit here. <laughs> All right, so that's the way we do that. Okay, Rolf, how, what, what's going on when, when we're in this little target here? What is actually happening that will allow us to produce this antimatter? Well, it is actually a spontaneous process. So every time you concentrate enough energy into a small amount of space, yeah. you produce antiparticles. But it has to be very, very hot. It has to be as hot as about a million times hotter than the interior of the sun. I think you've produced a little, yes, another I little uh, toy here well, to show us. Imagine you concentrate energy, you produce particles, but these particles do not come just in any kind of um, packaging. You stuff um, energy into a little amount of space and nature then gives you a packet which contains that energy and these packets are called the particles. Now, for example, there are particles which we have talked about, the proton and the electron. So now imagine I make that particle, I take it out of essentially empty space, voila, there it is. I've made this proton now, which has certain characteristics, as you can see. And now you see I've left a hole. And leaving that hole in empty space, in fact, it might sound very silly, but that is exactly what happens. It's the antiparticle. It has, as you can see, very similar properties, but for example, the absence of a, posi of a positive charge of this proton behaves like a negative charge, which is the antiproton. Now there are other particles, for example, the electron, voila, I produce that, and the whole, the anti-electron, the positron. Now, if, for example, I want to reverse that process, which I can do too, if I bring them together again, so I'm cheating a bit again, um, you have the hole here, the antiproton. now the particle which searches for its antiparticle to annihilate with, it goes in that hole, fills it again, and what you recuperate is the, space, the energy which is contained in that particle in the mass. And you see two gammas, two protons, two particles of light come out. That is what we think happened at the beginning of the universe when there was the big annihilation and these light particles, they still fill all of our universe with the cosmic background radiation. Okay, thank you. So let's assume that we understand how to produce antiparticles and from those antiparticles we can actually make antimatter. What do we want to do with it? Well, we at CERN, we have two principal objectives. Um, we want to explore um, what matter is made of and where the laws of physics come from, and we want to understand the symmetries between matter and antimatter. And so we use it partially to, uh, to reproduce the energy which we have put into it, concentrate, uh, concentrate it in the collision between particles and antiparticles. That's what we do at lab, for example. Okay. Or we take the antiparticles and study them very precisely. So we, for example, will produce atoms of um, anti-hydrogen, prot antiprotons and positrons, and we study if that atom behaves really in any respect like the hydrogen atom. In every respect. In every respect. Okay. That's right. And, and uh, I, th I think by studying these anti-atoms anti of hydrogen, it will also help us to answer uh, Alvaro's question as well. It will give us one piece of the puzzle. Okay. Thanks, Rolf. Rolf also is going to stay with us and take part in the interactive part of our show, which is coming up quite soon now. So if you have questions out there on the internet, please email them to us now. I think that has been enough matter and antimatter to digest, Mick, isn't it? So it's now time to take a break, and we're going to do that with music. Here at CERN, we have our own music group, and um, they're called Les Horribles Cernet, LHC, like our biggest accelerator. And let's take an, us on a tour to the anti-world with Les Horribles Cernet, anti-world. Sit 
was Les Horribles Cernettes, Cern's very own rock group. They actually play in a rock festival during the summer at Cern when we invite students from all over the world to come here and study and work with us. It's another of Cern's important educational programs. Before we go on into the interactive session, now's a very good time for me to say thanks very much to the people at the Exploratorium in San Francisco who have pioneered this, this technique of putting working scientists in connection with the general public and schools using the internet and webcasting as the vehicle. They've even sent one of their staff members over to help us, Noel Vanner, who's up on the rig up there. Thanks for coming, Noel. Okay, so now we're going to have some fun and we're going to have some questions. And I think, Paolo, we're going to start with Ulla Jarvi in Finland. Yes. Is that right? Yes, Ulla Jarvi. Are you ready? Again. Okay, go ahead you, with your first for, question. And, uh, okay. Go ahead you, with your first question. Okay, what can antimatter be used for and how could it be stored? What can antimatter be used for and how it can be stored, they're asking. Okay, so um, there are different uses for antimatter, but I think the principal use for antimatter right now is to use it in medical diagnostics. You use um, anti-electrons, which are bound in some um, mo molecule, which is injected into you, and then when it decays, it shows where this molecule is accumulated in the brain. But um, for the other things, we um, are still in the beginning of uh, the development, so I cannot really give a projection about what will antimatter be used for in about 10 years. What concerns the storage, antiparticles have an electric charge, positive or negative. So they can be stored in what we call traps, penning traps, which um, use a combination of electric and magnetic fields to keep them in place, and especially away from normal matter, because they would annihilate. And also that has to be in a very good vacuum, so there should not be particles flying around. What about anti-atoms, Rolf? Well, that is even a more difficult question because um, anti-atoms are neutral, so we cannot play the tricks with electric and magnetic fields, at least with constant fields. But the anti-atom behaves like a little magnet. And if I put it into a magnetic field, which is a zero inside and increases to the outside, then I can store it like a little magnet, like in a magnetic bottle. Okay, thanks. Have you got a second question, Ulla Yervi? Um, how does antimatter work in gravitation field? 
how does antimatter work in a gravitational field? This is good for a theoretical physicist. That's perhaps a question for me. Uh, we know that matter and antimatter both have energy, and the energy of both matter and antimatter are positive. Now, gravitation is a force that couples that has to do with energy. A particle of a certain energy has a certain gravitational pull or push over other particles. So the energy of particles and the energy of antiparticles being both of the same sign, gravitation acts on particles and on antiparticles on the same way. So if I was made of matter or antimatter, it wouldn't matter. I would still be standing up here and not flying off. Time for a third question from Finland? Yeah, why not? Go ahead. We can get another question from you. Okay. We can get another question from you. Can you use antimatter in space? Can we use antimatter in space? Well, I mean, you all know that there is the Star Trek and the Enterprise flying around, driven by antimatter. Well, um, as I've said, um, the, the problem of producing antimatter is such that I fear that in the foreseeable future it will be very difficult to propulse spacecraft with antimatter because in order to um, propulse a spacecraft which weighs several tons of, um, of matter with antimatter to the speed of light, you would need an approximately equivalent amount of antimatter and that to produce with the present technology would take millions and millions of years. So I fear that um, we shouldn't hold our breath for these um, starships. Okay, thank you, uh, Ulla Jarve. We're going to move on to our uh, studio audience and to our internet audience. Just before I do that, I'd like to tell you what these pictures are, which you might see projected uh, on your computer screens occasionally. These are pictures that were drawn by young school children when they came to CERN on an open day. We told them a little bit about matter and antimatter and then asked them to draw their own ideas. And this is what they produced. Okay, I think Antonella has a question for us in the studio audience. Is that right, Antonella? Yes, I'm sure because I saw before that somebody was looking for my microphone. So I'm waiting for somebody. Maybe I saw you. Uh, if the main difference between particle and antiparticle is the charge, how do you distinguish between uh, uh, neutron and antineutron? Who wants to take that? Yes, Alvaro. Ah, that's a very good question. Well, first of all, the neutron and antineutron are made of quarks, and the antineutron is made of antiquarks, while the neutron is made of quarks. And the quarks have charges, so the charges add up in both cases to zero, but they are the opposite charges in the quarks contained in the antineutron and the quarks contained in the neutron. On the other hand, there's a very good way to con convince yourself that this is a neutron and this is an antineutron. You put them together. If they annihilate, they were also a particle and an antiparticle. <laughs> More I questions could. from the audience. Go maybe, ahead. Don't be shy. Maybe we have one from the internet. Rosie, do we have a question from the internet? Do. <laughs> Elina from an high school in Finland is asking, how can you explain why photons, which are particles and have a mass, can't fill a box? I think this is you, Alvaro. In fact, um, the box that I was talking about was a box with reflecting walls inside so that the photons bounced. And that's, in fact, the answer to your question is that the photons do not fill the box. The quality of photons is that they cannot fill a box. You can always put another one in. While in the case of particles of matter, such as electrons, protons, and neutrons, there is a moment in which the get box gets filled. So photons do not fill a box. OK, thanks, Alvaro. Another one, Rosie, from the internet. Yes, uh, is uh, Federica from Italy. Uh -huh. Could you please tell us what is the importance of symmetries in physics? That's a very deep question. Um, as we understand better and better the laws of nature, we realize that very many things that seem to be different are actually the same thing. For instance, particles and forces are the same thing because a force between two particles is the interchange of another particle. So two concepts that seem different are actually the same. That's one of the symmetries of nature, the fact that 
very many things that seem to be different are actually the same. Like pointing there and pointing there is actually the same because there is nothing particular in this direction and that direction. And the uh, concept of symmetry plays a very important role in simplifying the um, mathematical description of nature. And there are many symmetries at many levels in nature. Okay, thank you. We seem to have a very, very shy studio audience, but that's okay, Antonella. You just keep persuading yeah, I them. I saw a hand uh, left. Oh, there we go. Hand. How can we be so sure that uh, antimatter, well, there is not antimatter in uh, around here? How can you be so sure there is no antimatter here? Well, there is a little bit of antimatter around here that comes in the form of cosmic rays. Uh, if there is antimatter, we see it because it would annihilate with uh, most of what there is around you, which is matter, and you would see the light coming out. So the fact that your uh, forehead is not flashing all the time <laughs> means that there is no antimatter particles in the air that is touching your forehead, forehead. Otherwise, you would see it. And there are indeed experiments looking for antimatter in space. Uh, yes, there are experiments looking for antimatter in space, and I think we'll talk about them a little bit later. Later on. More okay. questions from you. Rosie, do you have another question? Yes, uh, is there anti-photons? Is this a question from... The web is uh, still from Elina from Finland. Okay. Yes, the problem with the anti-photon is that it is the same particle as the photon. So the photon oh. and the anti-photon are not distinguishable. They are actually the same thing. So in a sense, there is no anti-photon. The photon is its own anti-particle. Okay, thank you. Where's Antonella gone? Yeah, Here, we have, have another so one in the front row. Uh, how, much does, how much does it cost to, produ to produce antimatter? How much does it cost to produce antimatter? You are well, the accelerator expert. <laughs> it's certainly not cheap. Um, if we count, say, pr the production which has happened here at CERN for the last 10 years, we have produced of the order of one billionth of a crumb, one nanogram. So that's, um, and that costs, well, conservative estimate, a few hundred million Swiss francs. So um, you can extrapolate that to produce one gram or one kilogram of matter would sort of go beyond the budget of even um, the whole world. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll call an end to this little section of interactive question and answer. We're going to come back and we'll give you another opportunity to ask questions a little bit later on. So uh, think about what we've been saying and if you have something, don't be shy, put your hand up and Antonella will help you with the microphone. Right now, we're going on into something else, Paula. Yes, we are going uh, now to go a little bit back in time to the beginning of uh, research in particles and in particular in antiparticles with a little clip on the history of antimatter. The history of antimatter begins in 1928 when Paul Dirac wrote an equation that implied the existence of antiparticles, the building blocks of antimatter. The scientific community was astonished until the first proof of their existence in 1932 when Carl Anderson observed the track of an anti-electron that he called positron. It wasn't until after the invention of particle accelerators 22 years later that the antiproton was observed by a team of physicists led by Emilio Segre and Owen Chamberlain at the Bevatron in Berkeley. Working with them was Tom Ypsilantis, then a young postdoctoral student. We selected out the, the slow particles. We were able to measure their momentum and their velocity, and we were able to measure the mass. And so we found the mass exactly of the proton, it, but it was negatively charged, so it had all the properties of an antiparticle. I mean, for me, it was, a, it was just one more example of our fact, the fact that we can understand nature. In 1955, a second team at the Bevatron announced the discovery of the anti-neutron. All three particles that make up atoms, electrons, protons, and neutrons, were now known to each have an antiparticle. The observation of a nucleus of antimatter in 1965 confirmed the symmetry between matter and antimatter, which was further proved in 1995 when the first full atoms of antimatter were finally synthesized in the Lear accelerator at CERN. Why anti-hydrogen at CERN? We had the basic ingredients of these atoms of antimatter, of anti-hydrogen. But the real process 
was still to be put in action. Uh, one of the best machines for this was the Lear machine, the low energy antiproton ring, where antiproton beams of large intensity were circulating over and over for many, many days. What is the reason why the anti-hydrogen or the antimatter are not in our universe? My real hope is that anti-hydrogen can be used for understanding this question. Antiparticles soon gained an important role in the game of high energy physics. Accelerators evolved into particle-antiparticle colliders, increasing the energy available for further particle production. In 1960, Bruno Tuschek proposed the first electron-positron collider in Frascati, whereas protons and antiprotons, after overcoming many technical difficulties, collided for the first time at the CERN-SPS in 1981. The future reserves more challenges. Very soon, a new antimatter machine will be operational at CERN. The antiproton decelerator will help physicists with the scientific challenge of creating and containing antimatter. Okay, so we promised you earlier in the program that we would take you to look at the future, and in fact the present, and now's the time to go and look at CERN's new antimatter producing machine, which is the antiproton decelerator. To do this, we can't go inside anymore because it's running right now, not running with antiprotons, but running with protons. But we have installed a robot camera, and we can go and take a look at the antiproton decelerator. And I think, Rolf, you're going to join me. And as we watch, we go around. This is the ring that you can see now. And it's inside that ring where you would see the magnets, etc., that I showed you at Lear. And of course, in fact, it's the train set inside those concrete blocks. We're now swinging across towards the experimental area where, for example, Rolf and his colleagues will be doing their experiments. What are you going to be doing there, Rolf? Well, first of all, you've just seen the experimental area of the AD which um, will house three different experiments which study um, as different aspects of antimatter. Now, what you're seeing here is one experiment um, called Athena, which will um, produce antihydrogen atoms. And um, what you can see is two parts. One is here, this shiny le um, left part is a magnet. Okay. Yeah. And there's another yeah. magnet over there which um, is also used. And the left part will store antiprotons, and the right part stores positrons. And in a later stage, we will bring these two differently charged antiparticles together, mix them like in a cocktail, and what we get out is antihydrogen. OK. I think it's time to move on now. Back round the ring, show you again. Hopefully, this time, you'll be able to see that it is, in fact, a ring. There we go, the robot camera is moving. That's one of the bends where you'd see the analogy of the uh, orange magnets that I talked about late earlier in the show. That's where the train is, the track. And we're now moving up towards the control room because that's where people are working right now. There you can see the control room window and there's somebody waving at us. That's Tommy Erickson. Tommy Erickson is a member of the AD operational team, development team, and I hope that he's going to be able to talk to us. There he goes. Tommy, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Mick. Wow, that's really good, because until about 10 seconds ago, I was getting through this little device in my ear the information that we didn't have sound to the AD. Uh, and I'm fine. really relieved. Tommy, thanks very much for joining us. Tommy, can you tell us what you're doing right now with the AD? Well, as you can see, there's a team here behind me of uh, engineers and physicists working hard around the clock to uh, make this machine uh, run, because it's a fairly new machine that's still in a setup stage. So somebody's there day and night, every weekend as well. Is that right? Yeah, more or less. And w yeah, I, said, I said a few minutes ago that you're running with protons. Why are you running with protons and not antiprotons? Well, uh, protons are uh, much easier to produce in large numbers than antiprotons are. And to be able to set up this machine, we need uh, large numbers of particles circulating so that we can measure the parameters of the machine and tune it 
Okay, so it means that the equipment that you're using to measure the beam size, for example, you need a good signal and you need lots of particles, therefore you use protons. Absolutely. Okay, let's assume that we then move on to running with antiprotons. Can you tell us again how we make these antiprotons for injection into the AD? Well, if you remember your block of uh, Lego bricks, if instead you use uh, a small uh, metal rod made of copper or uh, iridium or something like that, and then you take a high intensity, high energy uh, proton beam coming from another accelerator here at CERN, and you smash that into this metal rod. On the other end, you will get out uh, some antiprotons, and uh, with a bit of luck, you can inject them into this uh, AD ring and prepare them for uh, extraction to the experiment. And how many will you have circulating? Uh, we hope to have about uh, 50 million antiprotons circulating, and this is each minute a new shot of antiprotons coming in. Okay, so now, now, this is a very inefficient process also, the way we produce antiprotons here. As a matter of fact, for, for every antiproton produced and injected into the ring, we need uh, almost half a million protons hitting the target. Okay, so we have 50 million antiprotons circulating in the ring at approximately the speed of light. What do you want to do with them? Uh, then we need to slow them down from uh, close to the speed of light to about 10% of the speed of light. And then after that we can extract them to the experiment. Okay, so we take them at the speed of light and we apply some sort of break and they end up at the 10% of the speed of light and then you extract them and you send them off to, for example, Rolf's experiment. Rolf, how much antimatter are you going to produce with these antiprotons? Well, the number which um, Tommy just mentioned, 50 million, that's the number of antiprotons. Now, what we want to do is to take some of these antiprotons and recombine them to put them together with positrons. So we put the positrons in an orbit around these antiprotons. Now, that process in itself is also difficult, and not all antiprotons and positrons recombine. So what we hope for is about a thousand um, anti-hydrogen atoms in a minute or so. And how will you know that you've actually got them? Good question. <laughs> well, for, sadly enough, we don't know as long as these antimatter atoms are alive. We have to kill them. So what happens is these anti-atoms, at the beginning, they will not be confined, but they will just run somewhere to the um, electrodes. And when they hit the electrodes, they will annihilate, as I've shown, and produce some energy. And we have put a little detector around that. And this detector will then show us where these particles come from. And so we know that there was an anti-hydrogen atom present. So we only know that we've produced them when they die. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Tommy, thank you very much for joining us. I can see that you're all very, very busy up there. Of course, the people that we've shown you are only part of a very, very large and international team. They have lots of different skills and competences. To build a machine like this and to run experiments like this take people, accelerator physicists, experimental physicists, theoretical physicists, lots of technical support, and in fact, every member of the CERN personnel is working directly or indirectly on projects of this type. And of course, we'd like to wish all of them every success in the future. The international aspect about, of CERN is demonstrated here because, in fact, Paola is from Italy, Alvaro is from Spain, Rolf is from Germany, I'm from the UK, and we have other nationalities on our technical team. Okay, so that's what is the CERN does with particles and antiparticles. We do research on them. But CERN is not the only place in the world to deal with antimatter. There are many other labs that in particular study Hello. what we might do with antimatter okay. in the future. Let's view a short video clip with news from the world about antimatter uses. <laughs> For centuries, scientists dreamed of being able to peer into the human brain as it performs various activities. Now positron emission tomography, or PET scan, makes this possible. Developed in the mid-70s, PET has been the first scanning method to give functional information about the brain, and it is nowadays used to help diagnose several diseases. At the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Researchers gave volunteers injections of radioactive water while they saw or heard words. 
Since brain activity involves an increase in blood flow, blood mixed with radioactive water accumulated into the most active areas of the brain, enabling the scientists to build electronic images of cerebral activity. Most recently, a PET scanner has been used to look at the brain while it deals with emotions. Depending on whether the emotion is pleasant, unpleasant or neutral, this study showed increased blood flow and could picture the parts of the brain directly involved. Previous studies had shown distinct brain patterns in different psychiatric disorders, from depression to panic attack to schizophrenia. In June 1998, a state-of-the-art particle physics detector, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, or AMS, flew for the first time on the Discovery Space Shuttle. Its mission was to look for antimatter originating from outside our galaxy and also for dark matter, which is thought to compose 90% of our universe. AMS is a NASA and the Department of Energy sponsored experiment, built by an international collaboration of 37 universities and laboratories. During the first flight, AMS concentrated on the measurement of extraterrestrial antiprotons. Up until now, these charged particles which interact in the atmosphere have been measured only with balloon flown detectors. The second mission, in 2003, will see the experiment being carried on a shuttle to the International Space Station, where it will remain for three to five years. From here, it will search for complex antimatter nuclei. Their observation would indicate that large regions of our cosmos are made of antimatter. One of the latest spectacular surprises of our Milky Way galaxy is a mysterious cloud glowing in gamma rays produced by the annihilation of matter-antimatter particles. NASA's orbiting Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, which mapped the center of the galaxy, observed that gamma rays coming from electron-positron annihilation form a bright spot at the center, with a fainter horizontal emission from the galactic plane. What is even more astonishing to astronomers is that the map also shows a broad distribution of the same annihilation radiation extending in a region some 3,000 light years above the galaxy disk. This seems to imply that a fountain of antimatter positrons streams from the center of the galaxy. What could have created this cloud? The likely suspect is the black hole, estimated one million times the mass of the sun thought to reside at the core of the Milky Way. So it's now time for our second interactive uh, question and answer session. Paula, I've just been told by Rosie that lots and lots of people are sending us questions over the internet. Thank That's you. That's great. Thank you very much. Shall we start again with Uli Arvid? Yes, why not? Let's see if Finland is ready again. Hi, Uli Arvid. Are you ready for our second interactive session? Go ahead. Yes. What are the characteristics characteristics of antimatter what are the uh, characteristics what does it look like and so on what are the characteristics of antimatter what does it look like <laughs> yes alvaro if you say look like you mean seeing photons from something made of antimatter because that's what looking is now from the point of view of photons matter and antimatter are absolutely identical so if you look at something made of antimatter for instance, if there was a distant galaxy which was made of antimatter instead of matter, just by seeing the light from it, you couldn't distinguish it. Matter and antimatter look, in the proper sense of the word looking, exactly identical. Did you get that? We got a second question, or you want to know more about this? Uh, we have a second question. Um, is it possible to build an antimatter gun. Is it possible to build an antimatter an gun? Anti I think gun. Yes. An antimatter weapons. Antimatter weapon. Wrong. Well, I mean, a gun um, usually shoots um, bullets. In our case, I would say we shoot particles. In that respect, we can definitely have an antimatter gun. But as I said, it's just single particles. So the amount of energy released when you shoot one bullet at Alvaro, for example, would so be so small that he wouldn't even twinkle at anything. I mean, so it's um, a gun, but a very um, powerless gun. Have you got another question, Ulla yeah. How many researchers have 
in you have in CERN who only work with antimatter? How the researchers okay, CERN? Okay, so it depends a little bit on what the researchers, different researchers do with the antimatter. If you count um, those which utilize the collisions of matter and antimatter, so right now we have of the order of 2,000 that it's at lab. If you want to take those smaller um, cr uh, crew, which looks at the symmetry between matter and antimatter in studying the um, events very, um, very precisely, you would have, a f um, say, 150. Okay, thanks, Rob. Thanks, Ulla Yarvi. We may come back to you, but let's go and take some of these questions from the internet. Rosie. Yes. <clears throat> we have several people from Finland, Spain, and Germany that are asking the same question. That is, how does antimatter affect our everyday life? Who wants to take that difficult one? Well, I mean, first of all, the um, straightforward answer is it does not, because as we said, um, the um, antimatter seems to have disappeared at the beginning of the universe. But as Alvaro referred to, um, there is a very deep connection between that and our presence, because if there was not this asymmetry which evolved in the very first fraction of the second of the universe, we would not be standing here. We would be all some kind of photons floating around in the universe. So in some sense, the origin of our own existence is connected to this big battle between matter and antimatter. Now more concrete on the daily life, as I said, if you unfortunately happen to fall ill, um, antimatter can help you to diagnose maybe your illness. So that's for the medical diagnosis. As we saw in the video, the positron emission tomography, positrons are antimatter. Uh, okay, another one, Rosie? Yes, uh, Marvin from Germany. What will happen if the antimatter you produce gets in touch with your collider tube? What was the name of the person? Marvin. Marvin, Marvin from Germany. Germany. Okay. Could you repeat that yeah, question? Yeah, what happens if the antimatter you produce gets in touch with the collider beam pipe? Well, it annihilates. As, as, it, as soon as it gets in touch, as I showed with my little um, model here, it annihilates into pure energy. So it um, disappears. We've lost it. Okay, thank More? you. More questions from the studio audience as well. Raise your hand. Antonia is there with the microphone. Don't be shy. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Yes? Here we have a young lady. What's your name, please? Ermini. Thank um, you. How long is the life of the particles? How long do they live? It depends which particle you are talking about. The electrons and the protons of which you are made of uh, last forever we believe. Although we don't know, so we do experiments to see whether they have a very long, long life. In any case, they have a much, much longer life than the age of the universe. So if you want to see one decaying, you have to look at very, very many, just for the odd chance that one of them decays. Those are the particles that we have been talking about. The photons, the protons, and the neutrons in, uh, in uh, nuclear matter have uh, a life which is forever. Uh, however, there are particles that have a finite life. For instance, a neutron which you take away from nuclear matter and you just have by itself has a life of about 17 minutes, I think. Now, there are many other particles that exist which have much, much shorter lifetimes, a very short fraction of a second. And those particles are not common in nature now, but they were also common at the beginning of the universe. And we also study them at CERN. There is a collection of maybe uh, 10 or 20 fundamental particles, which are not only the quarks that make the protons and neutrons, but other types of quarks, and not only the electron, but other things similar to an electron, which are called a muon and a tau, and all those particles have very lo short lifetimes. So they do exist, they no doubt have a sense for their existence, but we actually do not understand why they exist and uh, why they have the properties that they have. Okay, thank you. Rosie? Yes, a group from Poland is asking, please, to explain again why there is more matter than antimatter. Okay, I'll explain it again. <laughs> um, the simple answer is we don't know. But we do conjecture that the amounts of matter and antimatter in the early universe were the same. Now, as the soup of matter and antimatter evolved by an evolutionary process, a little bit of extra matter was made relative to matter. Not that it was put in by hand by someone who happened to be there and said, let there be a bit more matter. It just evolved in the way that things happened. The uh, 
equations that describe the evolution allow for this asymmetry, which was like this asymmetry of falling left or right. There were a few more that fell one side than the other, and those few more were made of matter. So that there is a little, little bit of extra matter relative to antimatter in the early universe. What matter and antimatter annihilate, only the odd guy who doesn't have a couple, which is the antimatter particle, survived. And that is the matter that still is around. So no room for couples in our universe, only singles. <laughs> okay, thank you, Alvaro. Alvaro uh, mentioned a very important idea just now when he said that we don't know. And in fact, as you might have guessed, we don't know the answer to all of your questions about antimatter in the same way as scientists don't know the answer to all the questions that they ask themselves. That's why they do research. And one of the important messages of this program for you young people out there who are studying science is please continue because who knows, you may help us to understand the mysteries of the universe. Rosie, do we have some more questions? Anna from Finland is asking, can nuclear waste be annihilated with antimatter? Um, well, in principle, yes. But, as I said again, you would have to pr create first equivalent amounts of antimatter to annihilate all the tons of nuclear waste which we have. And that would be a process which would cost much more than um, others' um, um, ways to get rid of it. It would be cheaper to put it in a rocket and send it to the sun. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Any, do we have any more questions? Rose is indicating I can see, she I has can one. I can see somebody here in the front okay, row. Okay, somebody in the front row. Um, do we know what dark matter is and uh, what it is made of? Oh. Maybe we should repeat that because it's do a little bit... Do we know what dark matter is? Okay. <laughs> no, we don't. That's one of the things we know. We know that the universe contains matter and light and practically no antimatter, but it contains a lot of something which is called dark matter. Dark matter doesn't behave like ordinary matter, it doesn't make stars, so you do not see it. But you see its influence through gravitation on stars, for instance. So you see that there are things that you cannot see, so to speak. And those things are made of dark matter. And the universe apparently contains about 10 times more dark matter than ordinary matter. And in spite of the fact that most of the material in the universe is dark matter, we actually don't know what dark matter is made of. Okay, thank you. I'm being told that it's close to 11 o'clock and that we promised that we would stop at 11 o'clock. So for those of you who have to leave and go back to your classes, for example, at school, thank you very much for joining us. But I'm also being told that because we have more questions, we can continue a little bit. I'd just like to tell people that you can check out our website about what's happening in the future. So if you have to leave us, Please keep coming back here because it's here that we're going to be posting more information about antimatter, more information about what we're going to be doing in life from CERN in the future. We're certainly going to be coming back later into year, in the year to check out what's been going on at the AD. Thank you. More questions, Rosie. Christian from Switzerland is asking, could an antimatter universe exist? The question is whether an antimatter universe could exist. Yes, perfectly. In fact, a matter universe and an antimatter universe would be practically identical. So the same way that there is our universe that could have been an antimatter universe. Now, we believe that the laws of nature are such as to favor in this evolution that made a little bit more matter than antimatter, the laws of nature favor matter slightly over antimatter. However, there could be an universe where the laws of nature are slightly different and favor antimatter over matter. And that universe would be identical to ours, and the people there in an audience listening to me would talk about themselves as being matter and call ourselves us, antimatter, because matter and antimatter are so similar that it's a question of definition which is which. Okay. I think Rose is telling me you've got another one, yes? Yes, one more question from Poland. Why are you searching for antimatter? What result you are trying to find and what you have already found? That's for you. 
Okay, so why do we do these experiments? Well, as we said, in many respects, matter and antimatter look very, very similar. But since there was this slight asymmetry at the beginning of the universe, we know that there are some tiny differences between the two. And we are doing experiments to understand where these tiny differences come from. Okay, I think we can take one more question from Finland, Paula. Yes, Ola Jervi. Are you still there? Yes, I can see you. Have you got another question before we close? Sorry, no more questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for being with us and uh, see you at another webcast maybe. <laughs> okay, I think it's now time. Oh no, Rosie's sticking yes, her hand uh, in the air. One last one, Rosie. I, I do have another question from Dano. How can from we where? store... Sorry? Where's it coming from? I don't know, I have the name, Dano. Dano, oh. okay. Yes. Dano. How can we store antimatter? Well, um, as I said, we have um, a combination of electric and magnetic fields which stores um, charged particles. If we want to store neutral particles, we have to um, use a magnetic bottle which, is, which has a magnetic field which is zero inside and increases to the outside. And then this tiny little magnet which represents the antimatter atom is kept inside. Okay, thank you. It's really time to close now. If you have any more questions that you've sent in, that are outstanding. Don't forget that we're doing this whole thing again tonight at 8 o'clock and we'll try to answer those questions during tonight's program. And there is not much time left, I guess, than thanking everybody, thanking the audience first, studio audience, remote audience from Mula Yervi, and uh, you on the internet who've been following us live. I would like to thank our guests too, our technical team and Mick, and, Paula as uh, well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and also our production team. Uh, don't forget that if you want to follow this program again, you can either watch it tonight. It'll be slightly different because it's not really scripted. And uh, of course, we will be archiving one or both of them on the web. So if you want to use it as a teaching aid, if you're a teacher out in a school, then you, you'll find it on the website that I showed you earlier. Yes, and if you happen to come by in the Geneva area, don't forget that you can visit CERN. You can really come to the lab and see our installations. Check out the main website of CERN. You will find instructions how to visit our lab. So from all of us here, from Paula, from Rolf, from Alvaro, from myself, from Tommy and the people in the AD, from all of the production team, from all of our audience, Goodbye for now. Maybe we'll see you this evening, but certainly we hope to see you in the autumn. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.